Hello, everyone. McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Nanasani nations and within the lands protected by the Dush Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Welcome to this special event from the Wilson Institute of Canadian History. Warmest thanks to Rena Fraticelli of the Socrates Project for all the amazing organizational work. And a warm welcome to our esteemed visitors who are joining us from the Collaborative Project, which has also been of great assistance to us. This is the first of three days looking at the past and future prospects of democracy at the Wilson Institute. We have an extraordinary lineup of the brightest and best Canadians working on the history of democracy. So if the history and future of democracy is of interest to you, we would warmly welcome you to all of these sessions at the Wilson Institute. Now I would like to turn the podium over to Scott White, who has done such impressive work on the conversation, the place online where you can find some of the most talented and engaging people who share his vision of going beyond the ivory tower. And Scott will introduce tonight's speaker, and after the talk, we'll also begin a conversation with her. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, I congratulate you for braving the weather. And uh, I said to Nancy earlier, we're very disappointed that she didn't bring her weather with her from North Carolina. Uh, my name is Scott White. I've been a journalist since dinosaurs walked the earth. And right now, I am editor of The Conversation. And if you don't know what The Conversation is, I'm going to give you a one-minute brief. Remember 1980, there was that TV commercial where the guy was walking down the street eating a chocolate bar. And then there was a woman walking down another street eating peanut butter out of a jar for some reason. <laughs> and then they meet at the corner, and he says, hey, you got peanut butter on my chocolate. And she says, you got chocolate on my peanut butter. And it was a Reese's peanut butter cup commercial. <laughs> well, that's what we are. Uh, our authors are academics. And I like to say that they're the chocolate. I have a team of journalists who help turn it into language with great respect to the academics in the room so that everyone can understand it. And together, we are this uh, peanut butter cup that is there about knowledge, mobilization, but most importantly, to get the knowledge out to the public. Because you're here tonight because you're concerned about that. You're concerned about democracy and important issues. We'll talk maybe a little bit later about the whole issue of fake news and the things that we're all worried about. But I, um, if you have not read Nancy's book, I really encourage you to do it. You can do what I did. I went on, on Amazon and got it on my Kindle. And uh, as I said to her when we first talked, I scared the hell out of myself when I read it over the Easter weekend. Uh, there's some really uh, disturbing elements that she has, has unearthed. But I want to tie it back into um, the work that we're doing at The Conversation is working with academics to get this information out. And I think that uh, Nancy's book is a combination of excellent research, amazing history, and I would say amazing investigative journalism. I'm assuming you have all read this. You know Nancy's background. She's from Duke University. So without further ado, I ask you to welcome Nancy to the stage. Thank you, Scott. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you all tonight, and it just so happens that Reese's uh, peanut butter cups are my favorite uh, candy, so maybe that's why I like the conversation so much, um, but I, I highly recommend it to you. Um, I am delighted to be with you here tonight. I want to thank Max uh, Dajene for um, inviting me, and I am so pleased also to be giving the keynote for this two-day series on the realities of Canadian democracy. Um, as I understand it, there's going to be really new and cutting-edge research 
presented that was, will go deep into questions that uh, some of which are going to uh, uh, be raised at least obliquely uh, in my remarks. So um, let me just start with a little sample poll. I know that Canadians tend to be very well informed about uh, US politics, so let me just take a little sample here. Uh, how many people are concerned about the direction US politics are? <laughs> Okay, good. So, so you're all paying attention. Good. That helps me to know who I'm talking with. That's good. Um, uh, that's really important uh, because truly it has become ever more obvious that American politics are in profound crisis, both in Washington and in the states. We are seeing deepening dysfunction, all kinds of alarm uh, signals, and hurtling uh, downward as we meet. Uh, and sadly, given the dominance of the United States in the world and on this continent, uh, the troubles that we have in the United States soon uh, ramify out elsewhere in the rest of the world. So you know this, I can tell that you're all paying attention, but what you're probably struggling to figure out is how we reach the point that we have now and what that means. And this watershed that we have reached in American public life has, of course, been fed by many streams. They include the kind of movement conservatism that made Barry Goldwater the Republican candidate for president in 1964, just after his vote against the Civil Rights Act of that year. Another important and related stream is the religious right that has become so active since the 1970s. And there is a white supremacist right that has resurfaced with events over the last few years. All of these are important, and together they have yielded the votes to affect radical policy change. But tonight I want to address another piece of the puzzle of how we got into the dangerous situation in which we now find ourselves. And it's a missing piece that explains much that otherwise, hello up there, <laughs> remains uh, mysterious. And namely what I'm referring to are the ideas, the ideas that are guiding the billionaire funded radical right made famous by Charles Koch. Uh, and Koch himself actually said last year at a, a donor summit, what they call the Koch seminar series, where people pay $100,000 uh, a year minimum to be part of this. Uh, and they now have 60, 684 donors at last count. Koch uh, said, we have made more progress together over the previous decade than I had been able to make in the, the past 50. So he's got this sense of you know, coming toward consummation, that this project that he's been so intent on is now reaching fruition. Uh, and what I found in my research are the ideas that Koch has weaponized in order to achieve the success that had eluded him over that earlier half century. And so I believe that knowing about these ideas and how the Koch network uh, organizations have applied them is important not just in its own right, to help us better understand what is happening and why and how. Uh, but I also believe that having this knowledge may equip us in the US, and you will see there's a Canadian dimension to all this as I go on, will equip uh, citizens in various places affected by this project to lead the way out of this situation before it is too late. A public health nurse who read the book and wrote to me uh, used this analogy. She said, you need to get the diagnosis right before you can determine the best treatment plan. And I think that's a really well, helpful way of thinking about all this, that we really need a diagnosis that will illuminate this moment in which we find ourselves. Why does it matter so much to have the right diagnosis? Because there is an unmarked hazard in our public life in America now, and I realize you hadn't seen that slide, but there's an unmarked hazard in our situation. And that is that the noisiest threats have been getting the most attention. Above all, those coming from the White House uh, under the current president. But as this figure that I've come to think about as the distractor in chief, uh, as his now near daily spectacles and tweet storms draw nearly all public attention, in fact, an even more extreme plan is moving along apace. 
It is moving along in the 30 states, now dominated by this cause. It is moving along in federal departments and agencies, and it is moving along in our federal courts and increasingly in many of our state courts. This plan that I'll be talking about tonight is being pursued by a much smaller cause, but one that is archly determined and breathtakingly well-funded. And I imagine that most of you do have a sense of who the Kochs are, but I recently came across the uh, statistic from uh, George Mombio at The Guardian, who said that if you combine the wealth of the two brothers, Charles and, Co uh, and David, they are the wealthiest, they would be the wealthiest man in the world. So we're talking about that, that scale of wealth. Um, and this cause, uh, this determined and well-funded cause, aims to quietly rewrite the rules of American society permanently. To do so, they have also shown that they are willing and in fact determined to use the other sections of the right that I mentioned, in particular the religious right and the racially motivated right, to get what they want in the knowledge that otherwise they would not be able to achieve it because they are in fact a tiny minority cause, something I will come back to uh, as we go along. Uh, they're also an extremely radical cause. They're flying under conservatism as a flag of convenience when in fact Charles Koch was much more honest in the 1970s and talked about the radical, even revolutionary nature of their enterprise. So I will state my case briefly and simply, and that is that behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in US public life right now, there is a strategy in play, a cold-eyed, calculated strategy. And that strategy is far along. One of its field generals said this in 2015, and I quote, we are close to winning. They don't have the real path. They don't have the real path. That was Mark Holden, head of Coke Industries Government and Public Affairs Operation, gloating to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors that the critics of the Coke network, he was, he was talking pr predominantly about journalists, but he might as well have been talking about the rest of the citizenry, saying that they don't have the real path and we are close to success. Now, you've all heard, I'm sure, and read uh, a great deal over the last several years about the fortune that Charles Koch uh, has been investing in our politics, but what you've likely not heard about is the ideas, the technology, as Koch refers to them, that have made these investments lately so devastatingly effective. And I found in my research that it was an academic economist who taught Charles Koch that for capitalism of the pure variety uh, that they desire to thrive, democracy must be enchained. Not overthrown as in a coup with tanks and generals and all the rest, but rather quietly rigged so that it can no longer provide what citizens have looked to it to provide uh, for generations now from public health and public education to retirement security, anti-discrimination enforcement, environmental protection, and all the rest. My research uh, provides an unknown backstory to this defining moment in which we find ourselves, as it also explains that real path to which Mark Holden referred. At its core, the book is a story of two men, a thinker and a CEO, whose lives converged through a shared commitment to transform the model of government built up, not only in the US, but frankly in the West, over a century, now largely driven by collective organization among the citizenry. The uh, thinker was a Tennessee-born economist, James McGill Buchanan, uh, featured here, who spent most of his career in Virginia public institutions of higher education. You'll see how ironic that is as I go along. And the CEO is, of course, the Kansas-based Charles Koch, who spent most of his adult life, when he wasn't making Koch Industries into one of the largest privately held corporations in the world, spent most of his adult leisure trying to find a way to make the United States and the wider world, in fact, conform to his arch vision of economic liberty, a kind of free reign capitalism beyond the reach of voters and their institutions. By his own uh, accounting, he funded hundreds of intellectuals searching for this technology to break through. And finally, uh, spoiler alert, by the late 1990s, uh, concluded that he'd found it. <laughs> 
So the history my book conveys is first of all of the crucible in which James Buchanan came up with this idea of enchaining democracy to insulate economic liberty. And that was as the civil rights movement made headway in his adopted state of Virginia on his own campus at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, so much in the news uh, of late, uh, and in the United States as a whole in the late 1950s and 60s. And then the focus turns to how Charles Koch began funding an apparatus to make that idea of enchaining democracy a reality in a messianic quest that has produced the volatile situation we are now confronting. But here tonight, rather than retell the book's story, what I want to do is instead tell you a different kind of a story, the story of how I stumbled on the trail that led me to these findings. Because as you'll see, there was a whole lot of coincidence uh, involved. And I believe that knowing the route that led me to the pretty stark conclusions I've just shared with you will give you an even sharper sense of the stakes of all of this for our world today. Because it turns out that what we are seeing now is not the first time the libertarian right has shown itself willing to exploit white supremacy in order to advance a cause that I've come to think about as property supremacy, a property supremacy that will affect us all. So what led me to conclude this? In a word, accident. Coincidence, <laughs> serendipity, uh, I guess that's three words. Uh, but I am a historian of uh, social movements in the United States and their impact on public policy. Uh, and I have long had an interest in uh, the US South. And in 2006, I had just finished another book and I happened to go into the archives of the American Friends Service Committee in Philadelphia, the Quaker uh, service group, if you know them. Uh, and there I came across the tragic story of Prince Edward County, Virginia, a county in the old plantation tobacco belt of Virginia, whose white officials answered the US Supreme Court's 1954 uh, call to desegregate their, or, I'm sorry, this was 1959 when they finally did it, but uh, to desegregate public schools without further delay by, as the county officials put it, pridefully going out of the public school business entirely. They shuttered every public school in the county. They actually posted no trespassing signs in front of them. And they left black children with no formal education whatsoever as their white peers went off to private, a private segregation academy knowing that they would be able to enjoy state subsidized tuition grants, what we would today call vouchers. And the county officials kept the public schools shut in Prince Edward County for five years uh, until the courts compelled them to reinstate a school system. So I was shocked when I came across this story. There's actually been a few books that have come out since about it, but uh, it was the first that I'd heard of this. Um, and I started to research and very quickly learned that these tax-funded school vouchers were crucial to the program of Virginia and many other states in the South, the program of what they called massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. I also learned that the Chicago libertarian economist, Milton Friedman, many of you perhaps have read his book, Capitalism and Freedom, or knew his Newsweek columns or his other work, I learned that Milton Friedman had issued his first manifesto for such tax-funded school vouchers uh, in 1955, the year after the Brown decision, in the full knowledge of how it would aid segregationists. So Friedman became part of my story, and I thought, well, this is interesting. This is a story of this market fundamentalist, some people call it neoliberal project that we haven't heard, right? We're told it takes off in the 1970s. We don't know about this prehistory, and that seemed pretty important to me, so I started digging in. But in following a footnote, I learned of a 1959 report as this threat from Prince Edward County was in the air to close the schools that fall. They had been foot dragging, so you know, it went through the courts, but they were going to close them in the fall. And this report was by two other economists, both of whom had been trained at the University of Chicago, who had recently set up a new center at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And one of them was this James McGill Buchanan. And the report they issued was actually an effort to refute a movement of moderate white Virginians led by mothers and liberal clergy to save Virginia's public education system from these segregationists would-be uh, privatizers. So how did these economists fight? They made a case that the moderates had the math wrong, 
And if the state actually sold off all these tax-funded facilities to private operators, they said it could provide better education with more liberty. The liberty in Virginia in this moment that was the most important was liberty from the federal courts. So this report, in effect, called for privatizing uh, the South's public schools before that word was part of our uh, public vocabulary. Uh, they saw this as an opportunity to go after public education because it was public, and they were libertarian ideologues. Uh, and they did so, they issued the report in the full knowledge that the schools thus funded would be white segregation academies because those were the pro only private schools in question in this period. Black parents and their organizations opposed the vouchers to a person. Virginia already had some private schools and the NAACP said, sure, you can have private schools, but no one has a right to have their prejudices subsidized by the public tax revenue. So needless to say, as a professor myself, it stunned me to see two scholars making a case for what their state's most arch segregationists were seeking. And it intrigued me that they did so not in racial terms, but in economic terms, self-consciously leveraging the authority of their discipline and Buchanan standing as the new chair of the economics department in a university founded by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, to back up the state's powerful right-wing elite, knowing that they were exploiting the rage of white supremacists to move this libertarian economic agenda. Their cover letter to legislators with their report said that they were speaking out, and I quote, letting the chips fall where they may. So they were fully aware of the harm their actions would inflict. And as an educator myself, I wondered how anyone could do such a thing, not in irrational frenzy, but in cold-eyed calculation to move another agenda. So if my curiosity peaked, I began seeking out more information about James McGill Buchanan. I learned that he had gone on to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1986. He was awarded the prize for having pioneered a new way of thinking called public choice economics, which also became influential in political science and law, and I learned among activists and elected officials on the political right in the United States and uh, the wide world after that Nobel in particular. What Buchanan did that was new in his own uh, telling, in his own phrase, was the economic analysis of politics. The economic analysis of politics. But it was a distinctive economic analysis. What he did was apply Chicago-style libertarian uh, economic assumptions to political actors to argue that they could only, they should only, be understood as individuals rationally seeking their own personal individual self-interest, not the common good as they claimed. Uh, he pointed out, for example, how politicians answered organized citizens with programs they could tax others for. He repurposed a term in economics to refer to this as rent-seeking, as people trying to get through the power of their numbers what they could not get as isolated individuals from the market. He portrayed this as illegitimate collectivism. And as a thinker who specialized in public finance and who identified with the political right in the South and nationally, he made it his mission to find ways to lower taxes and to shrink the expanding public sector. And you have to realize, of course, this is the period after World War II, right? When the United States government was building the federal highway system, they were building up a huge public university system, uh, doing all these other things, building up federal science programs, all of these things. Uh, the federal government was taking on that were new, and Buchanan saw this as uh, illegitimate, as did other libertarians. So with this public choice economics, he turned new attention to what he liked to call the rules of the game, the rules of the game of politics, in particular to the taxing and spending incentives of the political process, with an idea to eventually also thinking about how altering the rules of that process could yield different outcomes. And I want to be clear and say that public choice uh, ideas have since in, in, uh, interested some uh, 
intellectuals, thinkers uh, who are not on the political right. Uh, there's a wider school of public choice, uh, even though it was started on the right in Charlottesville in, in 1963. Uh, but Buchanan's version uh, of this wider school, what he and his colleagues like to call the Virginia School of Political Economy, as opposed to the Chicago School or the Austrian School, uh, was always distinctive, I learned. Buchanan himself said, looking back in a documentary made in uh, 2007, that when he set to work in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there was widespread trust in government. There was a belief that actors in public life acted in good faith to advance the common good, the public interest, as they saw it. He said, that's what I wanted to tear down, I'm sorry. That's what I wanted to tear down, this hypocrisy of calling something in the public interest. <laughs> so again, I was new to this way of thinking, as perhaps are you, uh, and I thought, why would anyone want to tear down the idea of the public interest? As I read more, though, I learned that to a libertarian like Buchanan, there is no such thing as the common good. It is a fiction in their eyes uh, that will lead government, enable government, to coerce those who don't agree with the majority. And Buchanan had 20 volumes of collected works and a house full of papers uh, that I went through. And the only minority I ever saw him showing any real interest in was the minority of wealthy taxpayers and corporate officials who did not share the majority's view of the public interest. And government, Buchanan and his colleagues argued, all but steals the property of this minority if it taxes or regulates them for purposes they don't share. So basically he was at pains to insist that we should not be our brother's keepers. Or at least we shouldn't be able to use government to shift tax revenues from one citizen to another for these public purposes. And he came to talk about all of this in very stark and menacing uh, terms that are now widespread on the political right in America, owing to decades of inculcation from the think tanks and uh, other organizations with which he worked. And you can hear crude versions of it on uh, right-wing radio um, all the time. But I'll give you an example of uh, 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 these ideas in play. How many of you uh, remember here in the 2012 presidential election when candidate Mitt Romney uh, was taped at a $50,000 a plate dinner for donors, um, speaking rather contemptuously of the 47% of Americans he said would never vote for him because they were too dependent on government. Did you all hear about that here? People remember that? Okay, some uh, journalists and, and, and political watchers thought that, that that lost Romney the election in that moment for people to hear the way he was talking about almost half of the citizenry. But it turns out that Romney was not offering a new idea at that point. In fact, by the time he spoke, the Heritage Foundation, informed by uh, James Buchanan over the years, funded by Charles Koch, was maintaining what they call the annual index of dependency. The annual index of dependency derived from Buchanan's ideas to gauge, in their terms, how dependent the rest of us were on government. But it was Buchanan, really, who gave scholarly backing to such ideas. And he did not hold back in his language. He spoke of net tax recipients, those who get more from government uh, than they're paying in. Uh, you might say, such as retirees, <laughs> such as you know, mothers who are staying home, et cetera. But, but anyway, uh, public school teachers, um, he spoke of them as parasites on the productive. He also warned of what he called predators and prey, the predators being these collective organizations among the citizenry who go to government for help with some purpose or another, the prey were these unwilling taxpayers. His very vocabulary, I think you can see from that language, made millions of his fellow citizens appear to be uh, menaces, not even truly human, predators. Uh, prey, parasites, etc. This is a vocabulary that licenses uh, hostility and that is disinhibiting. And it is a vocabulary that is rife on the political right today. As I read more, I also learned that for those who think this way, social justice is a very simple matter, quickly disposed of. I keep what I earn, you keep what you earn. <laughs> 
and you collectively can only legitimately tax me if I agree with your goals and methods. And in fact, Buchanan's colleague at his last institutional home, um, uh, uh, Walter Williams, says this on the conservative political action trail. But Buchanan himself didn't stop with these kinds of assertions, with this kind of theory. Uh, in the 1970s, the early 1970s, in the wake of the uh, campus rebellion um, against the war in Vietnam, against uh, racism, uh, and so forth, uh, that he reacted to that upheaval by organizing, by urging right-wing officials that he had affinity with, such as Ed Meese, then Governor Ronald Reagan's uh, chief of staff, and donors on the right, urged them to build a counterintelligentsia, as he put it, by creating a gravy train his phrase, a gravy train that would bring men, as he said, into the libertarian fold and train them for this kind of intellectual battle to change the country. As he organized, he also moved from diagnosis to prescription. His vision was so radical that he believed that by this measure of protecting the minority of the wealthy and corporations from taxation and regulation they rejected, he believed that by this measure, every existing constitution in the world was a failure on this measure. Every constitution. You needed a new kind of constitution. So he began to develop a field he called constitutional economics with the goal of developing a constitutional regime that, is, as his colleagues said, would protect capitalism from government that could enshrine the rights of the wealthy minority to a degree that no society anywhere had ever done. No modern society. Buchanan prided himself on being, again, in his language, an academic entrepreneur. And he indeed turned to this pro project in uh, the mid-1970s at a pr propitious moment. That was after the military coup in Chile, uh, a military coup led by General Augusto Pinochet, overthrew a democratically elected government, destroyed the trade unions, the farmers' un uh, organizations, the student groups, the free press, etc., and pushed through the most radical program of market fundamentalist reform the world had ever seen. But by 1980, Chile had become a pariah in the world because of its systematic violation of human rights, and it knew, the leaders knew that they had to go back to a system of elected government at some point, particularly because they had an export-led economy. They had to go back to a system of representative government, but they wanted to lock in all of the things that they had done while the people had no power, including the privatization of social security and education and more. So they called in James Buchanan to Santiago in 1980 to try out these ideas for how to devise a constitution that would protect capitalism from government. And the result, the so-called constitution of liberty, is still in effect today. So much is it in effect that in 2013, Michelle Bachelet, uh, a president who was elected by two-thirds of the Chilean people to carry out wide-ranging reforms after a huge movement of students, college and high school students in Chile protesting that with this privatization, Chile's higher education was the most expensive in the OECD world. Uh, she came into office pledging to carry out these reforms, and she got into office, and she realized she couldn't. Her hands were bound by what she called the authoritarian trammels of this constitution of liberty, as they called it. And she said, Chile needs a constitution without locks and bolts. That's actually one of the titles of my chapter, a constitution of locks and bolts, because that was what Buchanan advised the creation of. Not a constitution of checks and balances, which all of us are agree, you know, would agree are important to protect particularly minorities long excluded from full citizenship, dissenting minorities, religious minorities, etc. But no, a constitution of locks and bolts on how responsive government can be to the popular will. And sadly, I'm not telling you this Chilean story as a digression. I'm saying it because that kind of a constitution, a constitution of locks and bolts, is now coming to the United States, owing to pressure from the Koch network, which de is determined to achieve the kind of binding uh, restraints on the popular will that Buchanan urged without informing the public of their true goals. And while the American people have been distracted 
by the current president and his daily tweets, uh, they have been assiduously organizing to move a constitutional convention. Uh, above all, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which you may have heard of, and a Republican Party that the donors have all but taken over and turned into a delivery vehicle. We can talk more about how. Uh, but thanks to all of that, this cause now has in place 28 of the 34 states' authorizations needed to call the first constitutional convention in the United States since 1787. It is an incredibly radical and reckless gambit, uh, and it could be a few years away at the rate things are going. Common Cause, a group you may have heard of, a good government group, have said that essentially these folks are seeking to roll back the 20th century, and that about captures it. Now. You may be wondering how I was able to pull together the way that Buchanan's ideas were guiding the real path the Koch network is following to shackle democracy. And the answer is, again, in good part, coincidence. I moved from Chicago to North Carolina in 2010. Just as a radicalized Republican Party dominated by Koch funded, uh, and their partner in North Carolina, uh, a man named Art Pope, uh, uh, Republican Party uh, poured in a ton of money and won control of both houses of the uh, General Assembly that year. And this figure, Art Pope, who was profiled in a piece by the brilliant journalist Jane Mayer in The New Yorker, a piece called State for Sale, uh, he actually boasted, uh, one of his think tanks boasted of the big bang. They said that his grantees were developing, or delivering rather, to make this once moderate state that was long a beacon uh, to the south of what could be done um, it, with public public investment and moderate politics, uh, they were calling it a laboratory for the cause, um, turning it into a laboratory using measures derived from this public choice thought. So um, to frame what it was they did in North Carolina, and you might be more familiar with what they did in Wisconsin under Scott Walker, same kind of program, uh, but uh, to frame this, I should uh, tell you that Buchanan uh, had long urged his teammates by this point to stop focusing on who rules and work on the rules. Because, he said, if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, and here you need to realize that libertarians, and I'm not exaggerating, don't like the 20th century's worth of public policy, uh, he argued that if you wanted to get the kind of radical transformation that they did, you had to focus uh, laser-like on systematically changing the rules of governance. And what I watched unfold in North Carolina, where I just moved, and in Wisconsin, where I'd gone to graduate school, was a stunning barrage of radical rules changes on this model, one after another. Among them, the most extreme and sophisticated gerrymander we've ever seen in American political history in order to misrepresent the will of the electorate. New measures to undermine workers' ability to organize for collective power in unions, particularly public sector unions and particularly teachers' unions, which are now the most numerous uh, and uh, powerful and, and, in the American sense, liberal uh, in the United States. Uh, attacks on public education at all levels, shifting of tax dollars off to unregulated charter schools, and radical cuts in funding in public education budgets and changes in university governance and so forth. Refusal to accept the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act despite a crying need for health care in our low-wage state where many people work full-time but couldn't afford health insurance also rolling back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming. In North Carolina, our Republican legislature tried to prevent the collection of data about the rise of the seas, to actually stop <laughs> collecting the information that would show climate change. Also, this new majority broke with customary governing practices like public hearings before passing significant legislation and transparency about the process. Instead, they worked with breakneck speed and often secrecy uh, and, and, and frankly, oftentimes with shame, shamelessness. They took rights away from uh, public school teachers uh, after midnight one night in a surprise uh, move. And then to uh, cap it all off, they passed what has become known in North Carolina as the Monster Voter Suppression Bill. 
The monster voter suppression bill called that because in some 15 different ways it tried to keep people who would be predict could be predicted to oppose this agenda away from the polls. Most obviously African American voters but also young people um, because they could tell that young people were not supportive of this vision. So what proved so surreal to me as a scholar reading into this project uh, and as a citizen watching this unfold is that I realized that this new Republican majority was applying James Buchanan's ideas, weaponizing those ideas to get what they otherwise could not. Certainly not if they had campaigned openly for the policies they were pushing through. They frequently campaigned on very different platforms and then uh, came the surprises, as with Scott Walker um, taking away collective bargaining rights from public sector workers. I could also see, because of my research, how the critics of all of this, and these are, North Carolina people are amazing. It was a pretty poor state that pulled itself up to the top of the pack by public investments, by good schools, by good roads, by public health, by all these things over the years. People were shocked at what was going on in the state capitol. But they were also, I realized, missing the deep operational strategy that unified these various measures. They couldn't see that the legislators who were pushing this agenda were not misinformed about the likely con uh, consequences of the, the, the uh, agenda they were implementing. These figures uh, fully understood that these measures would inflict grievous harm on many of their fellow citizens, the people who wouldn't have that insurance, the kids in the overcrowded classrooms, and so forth. But they believed that their end game was worth that price. They were, you could say, in cold calculation, yet again, letting the chips fall where they may. And what my fellow critics of all of this also uh, could not see, and I understand why, uh, but they could not see that this agenda was backed by an ethical system. It is backed by an ethical system that gave these actors confidence and let them feel heroic enough to weather the criticism and opposition they were getting. And I understand why it was hard to discern that ethical system, uh, because in fact this ethical system is at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world. Uh, it was especially hard, I think, for Reverend Barber that you may have heard of, uh, um, who led what was called the Moral Mondays movement. He's since been awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant. Hard for him to see it because this ethical system is so at odds with say, the parable of Good Samaritan, the Sermon on the Mount, the rest of the teachings of Jesus. And I say this not as a religious person, as a scholar. But it is an ethical system, one that has its own harsh coherence, which I believe we need to understand if we are going to figure out how to deal with the crisis created by the combination of Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money. So to make this very plain, and I know this may sound so um, bizarre uh, for Canadians, um, uh, given your public health system, but the libertarian morality deems it better for people to die from lack of health care than to receive it from government, from taxes paid for by others. And this really is what they ultimately mean when they speak of personal responsibility. What they mean is that you should be on your own, and ultimately, if they are successful, you will be on your own for all of your needs, from your children's education, which will be private because there won't be public schools anymore in that libertarian dream world, to your possible unemployment, to your health care, to your retirement, and on and on and on. You'll save for these things in individual retirement accounts invested where? with an unregulated financial sector. It's, it's so manifestly absurd that if it weren't for all the money backing this, you, 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 it, it would be unthinkable that th this would be happening. Uh, what they seek, in short, is a world in which we are legally barred from using government to help ourselves and one another by ironclad new rules, by that constitution of locks and bolts. I learned all of this and more in 2013 when James Buchanan died, and finally that September I was able to gain access to his private archive at George Mason University, his last institutional home. <laughs> 
And in his records, going back to the 1950s, I found my developing understanding of all of this confirmed. And confirmed, I have to tell you, in a way that sometimes left me reminding myself to breathe. I'll give you just one example of this. I found um, in his uh, personal office on the second floor of what was called Buchanan House, uh, a stacked on a chair a pile of documents that exposed how Charles Koch, some of his most trusted operatives from the various think tanks and operations he funds, George Mason University economics faculty, the law school dean at George Mason, the president and provost, and a politically appointed board of visitors headed by Ed Meese, uh, had collaborated to establish a base camp for this highly political project at a public university just across the Potomac from Washington, DC. This was in 1997 when Charles Koch gave his first $10 million gift to George Mason to support a big new uh, center for political economy. And Koch made it clear in the speech that accompanied this money that he wanted to see bold steps come of this investment. Uh, he told them, I, uh, he said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries. And he put operatives in place to make sure they would unleash this force. One of them was Buchanan's former colleague, uh, a man named Richie Fink, um, who made clear, uh, who became, had become by now Charles Koch's top political strategist. And Koch made, I mean, I'm sorry, Fink made clear that barging into the nation's higher education system by any means necessary was crucial because as Fink told the donors recently, it's an integrated strategy that uses universities, think tanks and political spending for the implementation of political change or policy change. And what kind of strategy is this integrated strategy that leverages universities and we could say dark money spending and think tanks? A stealth strategy because James Buchanan and Charles Koch both knew that the majority would reject the goals they were seeking if the people were told the truth. That is why they rely on misinformation, uh, such as climate science denial, the myth of voter, mass voter fraud, et cetera. To make the remainder of the story short, Americans have all felt the force of uh, Koch's, this operation built with Koch's money since then. And just as it did not start with the election of President Barack Obama, so it will not stop with the end of the Trump administration, however that happens. In closing though, let me pull back the lens from this, uh, oh sorry, and here's Charles Koch. Uh, uh, let me pull back the lens from this flagship campus outpost, and there are many, many more now, we could talk about that, to the overall Koch Network project of social and political transformation. Because when I brought home the, all the documents I had copied at Buchanan House and put them together with other sources I had been accumulating over the years, I found myself laying down pieces of a puzzle that literally astounded me in its scope and audacity. This Koch project now encompasses dozens of ostensibly separate national organizations, some of whose names will be familiar to you, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, ALEC, Americans for Prosperity, the Federalist Society, so much in the news with the seating of Brett Kavanaugh on the court. Uh, and if you include along with them the state level operations that make up something called the State Policy Network, uh, and then you add in the Atlas Network, uh, a transnational group with affiliates in over 90 countries, uh, and by the way, here are yours in Canada. We are talking about, or here's your number. <laughs> you can go to the site and get the particulars. We are talking about hundreds of billionaire and multimillionaire funded organizations that are working to radically alter government and society to try to bring this free reign capitalism into being without being honest with the people. As a historian of the American South, I also though came to realize something else. The form of government that these men see as liberty, as the free society of their dreams, 
would look a lot like Virginia over the first two thirds of the 20th century in all but the state forced racial segregation. When James Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in, oh, sorry, these are the agendas of the organizations. Um, when James Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in 1956 with the avowed mission, as his center put it, to preserve liberty, that verb carried a lot of weight, to preserve liberty, that state had just been identified by the great political scientist V.O. Key as the most oligarchical state in the South and therefore in the nation. V.O. Key had sort of a wicked sense of humor and he really wanted to drive home the point about how oligarchical Virginia was and so he wrote, next to Virginia, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. Think about it yourself in light of what I've shared with you tonight, in light of what you've seen uh, in the news uh, coverage of the last decade and perhaps other things that you have read uh, about this Pro Coke project. Um, what is the substance of this vision of liberty but mid-century Virginia, a state that had formally representative government but in fact was subjected to the most thorough control by an oligarchy. As I said, the state mandated racial oppression would go, but I think it's really important for us to realize that nearly everything else about the political economy of mid-century Virginia enacts the libertarian rights dream. Just a few examples. The use of right to work laws and other ploys to keep working people powerless. The suspicion of public education as a source of subversion. The regressive tax system and refusal to make forward-looking public investments for future generations. The insistence that government should not be allowed to regulate business to stop discrimination uh, in deference to the property rights of businesses. The deployment of states' rights legal arguments to prevent the federal government from promoting equal treatment. The opposition to social insurance, such as Social Security and Medicare, and to the empowerment of workers through the Wagner Act. And this man, Harry Byrd from Virginia, presided in the Senate, the Senate um, uh, as the main opposition to Social Security and Medicare, and his Virginia colleague in the House did the same uh, and also uh, uh, led the opposition to the Wagner Act, which empowered workers. And of course, of course, voting rights restrictions to keep those unlikely to support the system away from the polls, and gerrymandering to misrepresent the will of the rest of the electorate. And in fact, scholars have shown that that massive resistance program I told you about with the tax-funded school vouchers and the forced school closures and all of the rest of it would never have passed had Virginia not been so heavily gerrymandered to overrepresent rural areas and to underrepresent moderate cities and suburbs. So in short, what Virginia had then that the libertarian right seeks now is a system of rigged rules. Rigged rules that in combination ensure the uncontested sway of corporations and the wealthiest and most arch right citizens. That is, they seek to put, as my book title uh, 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 calls it, using a phrase from Buchanan, they seek to put democracy in chains. And the question this stealth plan presents us with, once we know it, I believe is at one level really quite simple. Is what this cause wants, the kind of world that we want to live in, and the kind of world that we want to bequeath to our children and our grandchildren, that is the real public choice. Thank you. I think we're going to do about 20 minutes here, and then we'll, we'll turn it over uh, and get some excellent questions from the audience. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, Nancy, I, when I read your book, and, I, and I'm a voracious reader, I've been a political reporter both in Canada and the U.S., and I was just stunned about the things I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the importance of, of stealth, and one of the things that um, in your prologue where you talk about where you found uh -huh. the Buchanan uh, papers, you said um, you called it a fifth column assault on American democratic governance. How have they been able to accomplish, they've been successful on the stealth Part. How has that happened? Yeah, um, actually, one one union leader who who uh, had read the book said to me um, uh, at a 
you know, discussion. How did we miss this? <laughs> um, and, and felt terrible and was really, you know, kind of almost beating himself for it. But I think it's really important to realize they didn't want us to know about this, right? Charles Koch's father, um, Fred Koch, who was at one of the founders of the John Birch Society, if you know what that is, he always told his sons to be kind of go under the radar. And he said, the whale that surfaces is the one that gets harpooned, right? So, so again, I, I think the single most important finding of my work is to discover these people people saying again and again in their own words, recognizing that they're a permanent minority, right? And that therefore they don't want to alert the public to what they're doing. Um, and that's why it's so important to have all these organizations seem so separate. You know, so we're all playing whack-a-mole thinking the public education fight is over here and that's different from the attacks on social security over there and that's different from the climate to science denial. And when you start to realize that it's all part of an integrated network in which people consult and work together and, and advance this, you begin to see it in very different terms. So, um, so I, I don't find it to be our fault, so to speak, that we didn't see it. Um, and again, there was so much coincidence to my finding this story uh, that I think the most important thing is what do we do with the knowledge that, that we have. So let, let's address the, I'm going to be generous here, the 260 pound orange elephant in the room. Um, you actually don't talk about Trump very much in your book, and I assume because of the time you were researching it. Um, he was not president then, um, but and you've called him uh, the great distractor. Mm -hmm. Trump has defied easy definitions. You know, conservatives say he's not a conservative. Um, what would what do the Kochs think of him? And does uh, and does yeah. he help? Does yeah. he help the the agenda? I feel pretty confident that Charles Koch would not invite Donald Trump to dinner. <laughs> you know, I think that he finds him crude and a vulgarian. There was one point in 2016 when he called him a monster. Although then, when people interpreted that as Koch network support for Hillary Clinton, he called that a blood libel. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, this is not about personal affinities. But Koch, I mean, uh, Trump has been incredibly helpful for their project. So. Under the Trump administration, this Koch project is moving along with incredible velocity. Velocity. So while we're again being distracted by those tweets and the daily, you know, storm that he creates, this Koch project is moving along in every federal department and agency and in our courts. And actually, recently, about I guess it's about three weeks now, uh, one Trump official said to a meeting of oil and gas executives, he said, this was reported in the Guardian. He said. It is absolutely thrilling to work for this administration. The president has a knack. The president has such a knack for turning the attention of the public and the media in other directions. While we do the work, he said, of the American people. You know, he's speaking to oil and gas executives. You know exactly what he was talking about. Um, so, so Trump uh, is. Um, uh, He's, you know, there's a few things that they disagree on, but not many. The only time they spoke out against him in a big way was when he talked about tariffs. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you look, Betsy DeVos running the uh, Department of Education is rushing headlong to privatize our school system, to bring back for-profit colleges that were gouging students. Um, the Labor Department is undercutting all of our labor standards. The Environmental Protection Agency is being run by people f who, from the fossil fuel industry. The, in, you know, I could go on and on. There are, are key people who come out of this Coke network in all of these different positions, including Mike Pence, the Vice President, uh, and also if you've Stephen Moore, uh, if you've seen the guy who was just nominated for the Federal Reserve, Nobody seems to have noticed that he's a big libertarian who's long been in the Koch network um, and was trained actually in Buchanan's program at George Mason. So they're just, they're all over the place. So I think um, our media have really ill served us in the US with a few exceptions because they treated the Koch network story as the big story uh, all the way up to 2015. And then it's become Donald Trump all the time. And they don't they don't ask the questions that could yield the information that could help the public. I mean, they don't even get it, I think, but they certainly are not asking the questions that could help the public to understand. Right. You mentioned in the book that your father uh, voted Republican. He was an Eisenhower Republican. Um, and you also say that the, the Republican Party that many of the people in this room would have grown up knowing about no longer exists. Uh -huh. How has, one of the things I found really amazing was how um, 
the definition of conservatism and, and even libertarianism has mm -hmm. changed because of a lot of the work by the stealth yeah. network. Yeah, I actually quote some leading Republicans uh, in the introduction to the book too, including Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah that many people may, uh, you know, like people of a certain vintage <laughs> might recognize as a uh, Reagan Republican. And he actually said, um, the, the, I quote him saying, uh, these people aren't conservatives, they're not Republicans, these people are radical libertarians, I despise these people. That's what he said when they primaried, primaried him, which is their tool to get compliance, but now, Fast forward, it was Orrin Hatch who wouldn't let President Obama's Supreme Court Justice nominee um, Merrick Garland get a hearing. So essentially what the, the Kochs have done, again weaponizing Buchanan's public choice ideas, is to think about the incentives and the penalties, right, and how to change those to get what they want. So what they have done to the Republican Party is use uh, a kind of a pincers move where they uh, support primary challenges against any Republican who doesn't toe the line and they agitate the base for that. You know, these people have now gone from the Tea Party to Trump. Uh, meanwhile, the donors are funding, you know, have this huge pool of cash that will supply those primary challenges from the right and will also reward the compliant. And to give you a sense of how effective this joint operation is, in the 1990s there was no difference between our two major political parties in the U.S. in uh, how, in their understanding that climate change was happening, what was then called global warming. Of course, they differed on how they talked about dealing with it, but no difference on the science. Fast forward with this Koch network, with this joint maneuver, um, which they call the accountability play, our secret sauce, so to speak, one top Koch person says. And by 2014, only eight of 278 Republicans in Congress would admit that climate change was human caused. Eight of 278. You see the same thing with Trump now, right? I mean, they are marching like this Leninist party with, you know, almost total discipline um, to protect this president. And so that's how they've done it: is with, you know, again changing the incentives, changing the penalties, and also changing the law. They were behind the litigation that became Citizens United, which opened the spigots to these incredible amounts of cash in American politics. You mentioned Leninist. This is the other yeah. thing that's fascinating: is doing your research, you yeah. found that one of the heroes yeah. was Lenin. Yeah. Explain why. Yeah, so this was really interesting. I think I mentioned earlier that they're now, f the libertarian, you know, the Koch cause is now flying under what I call the false you know, flag of convenience, calling themselves conservative, when in fact they are radicals, radicals of the right. And in the 1970s, Koch was clear about that. So I think I have one chapter that's called Never Compromise. Um, and and because that's what he insisted on among the ranks that he was funding, uh, this libertarian hardcore in the 1970s. And one of the, the top intellectuals he patronized then was a guy named Murray Rothbard, who had grown up in New York, who had relatives who were part of the kind of communist milieu um, in New York. And Murray Rothbard, uh, Koch invited him to, to Colorado um, at one point in the 70s, and, and, um, and, and Koch wanted to bring about this radical transformation, and, and, and uh, Murray Rothbard said, we've got to read Lenin. <laughs> You know, you know, obviously they don't like communism, but he's like, he had ideas for how a minority can, you know, pull off something pull like this. Pull off a revolution. Yeah, and right. so that's yeah. when Koch started funding the Cato Institute, you know, beginning to develop these campus centers and do other things to create this libertarian cadre, as they called it, using that kind of Bolshevik language of the cadre. Um, and that cadre now is in place in these institutions around the country, carrying out the program. And they're so determined, uh, and they so refused to compromise, they can, they can all also move um, much larger bodies, you know, so the Republican Party, again, in Congress, John Boehner, you know, threw up his hands in disgust because, like, the compromise is a dirty word for these people. And he actually said, John Boehner, who was the Speaker of the House, he said, after he left, he said, the Khmer Rouge are in charge now, <laughs> if you remember the folks from Cambodia at a certain point. So, yeah, this is really, that was a shock to me. And actually, Charles Koch, in his book, Good Prophet, cites Lenin among a number of people who have influenced his thinking. It, it, the other thing I wonder about, though, is um, you saw in the midterm elections in the yeah. U.S. that there suddenly now seems to be um, a revitalization of people who are getting recommitted to uh, standing up to. And I wonder if I was in the Coke network, if I would see Trump as much as something that's going to hurt me, mm -hmm. as opposed to if Mike Pence had been right. president. 
What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think they are quite nervous now and they're trying to rebrand in different ways and present a kind of kindler, gentler image because they realize they've lost the younger generation too, that, co that uh, Trump is such a bigot and has performed so outrageously that um, even a majority of young white people voted against the Republicans in these midterm elections. So, um, so you were saying when you read the book in the um, exchange we had before this that you were kind of shocked and depressed. And I do want to say that it's been really exciting for me uh, since the book came out, it was in June 2017, um, to be traveling the country and to see how people are really realizing what's going on. Not everyone, but a lot of people, a lot of unions, community groups, environmental groups, civil rights groups, the women's groups who have built up indivisible, public uh, um, teachers, lots of people are starting to realize that we are an all hands on deck emergency for democracy uh, in the United States and they are starting to work in different ways to get beyond the silos that have so long divided uh, folks on the progressive side to start thinking about their own long game, to start taking the courts seriously and judicial thinking. So I've actually been really impressed with what I've seen uh, in responses to this. I mean, it's the 11th hour, <laughs> uh, sometimes happens, but, but I think a lot is underway now that's really exciting. And actually, it's a, introduce an element of uh, humor, um, there's a journalist, uh, a DC-based journalist who is in, in law professor who have said that um, Donald Trump is an alien sent from outer space to unify the American left. <laughs> it's true. And so I think that's true too, that there's a kind of unintended consequence here, that he has just been so outrageous that not only are groups that had been doing hard organizing but facing this, you know, these constrictions on democracy, um, not only are they seeing with new eyes and working with more determination, but all these people who hadn't been paying attention, who hadn't been active are. So we have like women after 20, 16 with the you know women's march which was a worldwide phenomenon was huge the rise of these local indivisible groups they're called that are monitoring this administration and and uh, you know activating voters all the new um, uh, people elected to Congress we have the most diverse congressional delegation we've ever had on the Democratic side in the US now um, the Parkland students who have gone around the country trying to organize for common sense gun uh, law reform teachers mobile there's so much going on and I think part of it is that the current occupant of the White House has made people feel like this is it. <laughs> you know, we have to become active. Right. And I don't know if you have heard this here, but um, uh, today I was just seeing repeated again the figure that he has said 10,000 falsehoods since he came into office. And apparently there's like a, a website that the, that's the Washington Post has been, and yeah. they, they made and a big how, thing. You know, many of them just outright lies, yeah. you know, and that are repeated again and again, even after they've been corrected. So it's really... Um, it's so disturbing that I think a lot of people are starting to react, including, by the way, today, uh, um, Patty Reagan, Ronald Reagan's daughter, had a very powerful op-ed in the Washington Post that said that they should stop using her father's name for all of this and basically calling the Republican Party chickens to not stand up to this man. But she said it much more eloquently. It's the, 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 your, uh, when you talked about Romney and the 47 percent, that wouldn't even register on a newscast if he yeah. said that today, which shows how much things have changed. You had a graphic up there about the Atlas Network, yes. and they had the number 13 mm -hmm. uh, in Canada. And uh -huh. if you go on the website, you'll see, and there's at least three of them that you, people here will be aware of. Uh, the Manning Center, um, the Canadian Tax uh, Taxpayers Federation, and the Fraser Institute are mm -hmm. part of the Atlas Network. Um, Tell us a little bit more about the Atlas Network mm -hmm. and what you think Canadians should be concerned about. Yeah, so this Atlas Network is very like um, the domestic uh, federation we have in the US from the Koch Network, which is called the State Policy uh, Network. And basically, it brings together these groups, and at least on the US side, as a condition of funding, they have to share resources and best practices. So, you know, forcing them to be more effective and to be uh, have, have great or impact and I think that what you should expect, and granted, you know, we have different legal systems, different traditions, you know, you have a public health uh, system, thankfully, uh, in place, um, so some things will work out differently, but I think you can expect from many of them, climate science denial, attempts to pollute the public conversation on what's happening to the planet, and by the way, before they were doing uh, climate science denial, Buchanan's colleagues at George Mason, uh, several of them were involved in what was called the Cash for Comments Network that was working with the Tobacco Institute 
Institute to protect the tobacco companies who are lying to the public about um, the impact of tobacco. So you can expect misinformation. Um, I think, I don't know how your, your voting system uh, works, but I think if, if it's possible for them to do so, you can expect uh, efforts to suppress the vote. Um, you know, again, in our case, using the, the myth of mass voter fraud um, that leverages, of course, racism to make people think, well, yeah, there's all these illegitimate voters. Otherwise, how do we get a black president, right? That's kind of the, the logic. You can expect incursions on your university system. Uh, oh, and I have over there um, some flyers about the wider uh, Coke um, uh, effort to break into the universities. And so I always like to look up schools before I visit, as the figures are, are uh, not up to date, but uh, McGill University um, was the only Canadian university I saw now getting money, getting a half a million dollars. Um, but I suspect there are probably more now because it's mm -hmm. moving along pretty quickly. Um, so a tax on your public education. So pensions, um, very much going after public pensions, trying to privatize public pensions. So yeah, you can expect a lot of this. Yeah, it, it's interesting because in Ontario, the, um, Doug Ford is now the premier, and in the conversation, uh, we published a piece yesterday about uh, some of the changes that he's bringing in the education system here, and both uh, this focus specifically on the post-secondary was based on what Scott Walker tried to do around, I think it was called the Wisconsin idea, mm -hmm. that was to base funding on, on government, on, on universities meeting the needs of business. Wow. Um, so, and you know, mm -hmm. th the things you just talked about is this country's debating a carbon tax. And, and certainly that will be one of the largest large issues going into our federal election. So we, I think we are seeing some of yeah. those things uh, happening here. We're going go to go to the audience in a minute, but I have, I have one last question I wanted to ask you about. So most of the U.S. media coverage mm -hmm. has been about external threats to democracy with mm -hmm. the Russians and the cyber um, attacks. And then you have a very chilling account of an internal attack on democracy. Yeah. Is there any hope? Yes. Uh, well, and the internal attack um, uh, has been more significant than the external. There's a, a brilliant uh, communications researcher at Harvard named Yokai Benkler who had a piece. His book is very expensive. I just went to buy it for eighty-seven dollars, maybe not. <laughs> but he has a terrific article um, a interview in the Boston Review about this really cutting-edge, really interesting methodology research um, that they did to. Uh, they were. They actually thought they were going to prove the Russian impact. And what they found. Uh, and there's all this other stuff they found that I won't go into. I want to hear from the audience, but um, but they found that um, that the Russian influence was far uh, overshadowed by the domestic threat of the Fox. Breitbart, you know, that whole circle. And what they found in the way that they studied this is that the rest of the media system in the U.S. is polarized but still operating normally. You know, so you have people on the right who, you know, will look at some publications you'd think more on the left, people on the left who will read the Wall Street Journal, what have you, you know, and, and people debating about evidence in, in the ways that we always did in, in journalism. But what you see in, in Fox and that whole um, uh, structure of the media is a kind of hermetically sealed uh, universe, which they could tell because of the way people post things on social media and it doesn't they don't go out they don't bring other stuff in mm -hmm. they just do their own stuff and basically it's 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 devoted to constructing an embattled political identity which then they poke constantly right to make people feel like they're being aggressed upon so they have to strike out so it's really chilling um, what even just the media piece of this is doing um, again that said it, it is um, it is really Serious stuff. I mean, I and I honestly do believe we're at an all hands on deck emergency, and what happens in the next two to five years is going to be decisive. Um, but that said, I also don't think there's any reason to panic <laughs> or act stupidly. Um, I think that we uh, should realize that in that fear that this network has of the majority, right, of an aroused majority that understands what they're doing, that is a source of colossal power, right? So even in this room, if everybody in this room, you know, were to inventory, who do I know? What networks am I a part of? What organizations am I in? What are my skills? What are my talents? You know, and think about how to get the word out, how to, you know, be active on, on the challenges you face. We, we'd see a very different situation. And because so many organizations now are making structural democracy reform the key, um, uh, a key priority, I, I think that it's going to be, I don't know, like, you know, they used to have those atomic clocks, you know, I think yes. it'll be like 10 minutes to midnight, but I'm starting to feel like, like, not only 
could this effort be stopped, but in stopping this acute threat, we will deal with the chronic problems that have plagued our democracy for so long. You know, the, the money in politics, the misrepresentation, the, you know, um, effort, the, the ways that voter participation is, is uh, suppressed in the US and all these other things. And then if we actually have a really functioning, healthy democracy, we might actually meet the challenges of our time, right? And go on to do good things. So I actually, I, I know it's a very um, stark message and I don't want to sugarcoat it at all, what I see happening in the diagnosis, but I also do feel confident that, that we can rise to this challenge. Excellent. Thank you. Do we still have time for the audience? I think we might have a few questions from the audience, uh, if you'd be willing to entertain them. Yes, sir. If there's anyone who would like to ask Nancy a question, yeah. If I were, uh, any folks from I think they're bringing Mike to you. Uh, if I were working on a. It's on. Yeah. Is it on? Good. Yeah. If I were working on a plan, as you've outlined, of uh -huh. the Koch brothers, um, I wouldn't be just infiltrating the Republican Party. I would be infiltrating the Democratic Party. What's, what's your finding on that? Oh, yeah, interesting point. Well, and I should say I was following, you know, the Buchanan story and the effort to enchain democracy, so it's not like I have access to all sources. Um, but uh, I can say that Richie Fink, the man I quoted earlier, uh, was on the Democratic Leadership Council, got himself a seat on the Democratic Leadership Le which was like the effort mostly by Southern governors to turn the party to the right um, uh, in the 19, in 1980s and 90s. Um, so certainly there was that. Um, I, I, yeah, I've never seen Democrats who supported voter suppression. <laughs> I want to be clear about that. Um, and, uh, and there is a fight now for the soul of the Democratic Party going on in the U.S. because a lot of ground was ceded to these ideas that government, you know, is the problem, not the solution, that unions are a problem, that, you know, civil rights groups ask too much and so forth. So, um, so that's happening. They are also, though, trying to make inroads with unlikely constituencies. So they have something called the Libre Initiative that aims at Latinos. They've been giving money recently, large large amounts of money uh, for scholarships to the um, uh, uh, United Negro College Fund and the Thurgood Marshall Fund. Now, they know they're never going to persuade the vast majority of Americans, but it makes them look good. It's protective for their image, and it may pry off a few people. Um, so they are, as some people say, greenwashing in the, the language of the environmental movement, but the, the basic goals are the same. Yeah, there was a woman's hand right there. Yeah. <coughs> I'm just wondering if you know whether Coke has read your book and what he thinks of it. I'm sorry, whether what? Has Coke read your book? <laughs> uh, that I don't know. I can tell you that many of the uh, academics that he funds um, and the operatives that he funds have read the book. So if you were to go online um, and look me up, you'll see all kinds of um, attacks from them. Um, and uh, maybe I'll pass these out in, uh, when we finish, but there, I, I, there's a great group, uh, well, you probably know Greenpeace, but a researcher from Greenpeace and then this wonderful group of young people um, came out from students on campuses infiltrated by this Koch project, including at George Mason. Um, two researchers, uh, these two came together from those two organizations uh, before I knew them or they knew me, but they saw the attacks on my book and they thought, oh wow, this is the same that these guys use for climate scientists, <laughs> the way that they're attacking her. So they started a media tractor, uh, a tracker on you know all the coverage, and they found that 92 of these attacks on me were from Coke-funded faculty members and operatives who weren't declaring their conflicts of interest in like kind of ethics 101 for journalists. Um, so they they have been really alarmed about the book, and they went when it was it was um, a finalist for the National Book Award, and so they went absolutely crazy. Then like the National <laughs> Review had like multiple pieces about, you know, you know I, they, they, they do some really ugly stuff. But again, you know, I think it, it, it sounds hard to believe because these people are so wealthy and so powerful, but the truth is from their own perspective, this is kind of a desperate strategy because they saw that they were losing to democracies that were becoming more inclusive, right? That were bringing into participation all these people who had not participated before. They saw the fall of the Soviet Union. People were talking about a peace dividend. What can we do with all these public purposes? 
that we have let languish during the Cold War. You know, even Republicans were talking about that. Action on the climate. So they're doing what they're doing from a place of kind of desperation. And they show that desperation when they go into attack mode. So, um, so. I, I feel like I treat them now as gnats. Now, now, some of them are worse than that. You know, the ones that are kind of the Fox News viewers who make death threats and stuff. Um, that, that's another kettle of fish. But the ones that I've had to deal with are just, you know, paid hacks, <laughs> basically. Yes. I would like to ask you, as the economist, uh -huh. this ways on the socialistic communist economy after I started at McGill Capitalism. First, I was, I was taken so much by capitalistic pure economy that is so great. But my question is Buchanan, he consciously uh, went away from the pure capitalistic economy because he was serving only the elite, oligarch elite, who has money. Uh -huh. And the pure economy is like capitalistic, is left by itself. And political economy, I don't know, he crossed the ethics of economists. Uh -huh. Did he did this, because you make research of Buchanan, yeah. did he do this consciously or uh -huh. I don't know, some, like he got $10 million for institute, yes? Uh -huh. He was pay out or what was his like ethics about it? Yeah, so, um, uh, so he had a sense of himself as being a very ethical, principled person. Um, uh, but you're absolutely right that this, and this pure capitalism doesn't exist anywhere, right? All markets are creations of publics. They cannot function without the rule of law, without you know all of these other things that come from governments that they rely on. So the question for us is not whether there will be a free market economy, but really what are the laws and the measures that are going to govern that economy? You know, and I think most, you know, progressive economists now to in the US recognize that markets do some really useful work that's hard to replace. Like especially if you want to whatever, buy a good shirt or a sneakers or something like that. But markets are terrible at providing things like health care or other things. Um, and also uh, capital is, you know, corporations have a tendency to concentrate, to monopolize. Look at Jeff Bezos now in the United States and has enough power that they actually, Amazon paid no federal taxes in the United States for the last two years, as did, and, and, and then I think they said the number of corporations who haven't paid taxes has doubled under the Trump tax bill. So, so I think that we need to get away from this kind of fictitious and misleading language um, that speaks of free markets, you know, when really what we're talking about is different systems of governance of markets, one of which benefits the vast majority and ensures that opportunity continues and new players can get into the game, and one of which stifles opportunity, concentrates political power, and enables the rigging of the rules. And uh, so I think like there's some, if you, as an economist, you probably know Joseph Stieglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman, you know, there are Robert Reich, a number of people who actually had been enthusiasts of the neoliberal ordering of, of the world economy in the 1990s have really changed significantly in what they're saying now. So there again, too, I think there's movement in intellectual mm. life that's that's really encouraging and positive. But Buchanan, you know, he just had um, like he. Well, <laughs> read the book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots of contradictions. I, I, I want to allow more questions, so I want to keep my answers crisper. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for all your books. Thank you. Uh, not only uh, Democracy in Chains. Uh, the one thing that keeps me uh, questioning and, and, and trying to figure out. Uh, you, you do a beautiful job, I think, of exposing uh, what the libertarian right would like to call economic liberty. Right? Uh -huh. I like the way you, you do all that. Uh, of course, now we have, especially with Steve Bannon, right, yeah. uh, champion an economic uh, nationalism. Mm -hmm. And the economic nationalism, of course, undermining in many ways a, a, certainly a global agenda, a neoliberal mm -hmm. global agenda uh, involving uh, free trade from their perspective. I'm just wondering if you, you know, how would you, because I think there are affiliations, I don't think any, any I think everyone would agree there's affiliations uh, between Bannon's economic nationalism and the libertarian rights, mm -hmm. uh, economic liberty, right? But uh, how would you describe the affiliation between the two? 
Uh, and also, would you perceive uh, the economic uh, nationalism of Steve Bannon and the way it's mm -hmm. taking off in mm -hmm. Europe, especially uh, before the European Union elections, perhaps is something even more dangerous uh, mm -hmm. in terms of a right-wing yeah. development? Uh, yeah, you thank you for that. It, thank, uh, you. thank you for that. Yeah, I think that um, some of the connections are uh, deeper than we might realize. I think of it almost like a, a kind of family feud um, in the sense that um, you know Steve Bannon uh, is also a creation of the Mercer, Mercers and um, who the Mercer family who was part of the Trump uh, of the Coke donor network and then peeled off to support Trump as did the hedge fund manager Peter Thiel and a number of others and I think you know ultimately they do want to build up this kind of corporate power but I think some of these people have realized that they they, they want to use that right-wing populism to kind of smash through all the defense of the state to get there. Um, and uh, so there are these conflicts, but I, like I've, there's also um, uh, some Central and Eastern European historians who have written on this, particularly a guy named Quinn Slobodian wrote a book called Globalist, but he, excuse my language, but he had a great piece um, uh, that was called, an article uh, you could look up called Neoliberalism's Populist Bastards. <laughs> and it was about um, Central Europe and these, cent these, these right-wing populist movements that were developing Developing, but many of them were spinning off from these, you know, neoliberal groups like the Hayek, you know, the Hayek um, folks and everything. Um, and so, again, I think he actually does use that language of a, a um, you know, a, a fight among sort of kib siblings. Or um, uh, so. It, but I totally agree with you that this is such a volatile situation that we're confronting now with people like Steve Bannon and uh, Donald Trump and others inciting um, this, this kind of rage and scapegoating, uh, particularly of immigrant populations. And if you put that together with climate change and the fact that this network and the Trump administration and these other folks are also preventing us from acting on the threat to the planet, which we have like a 10-year window to do, and they are trying to slam that shut and stop us from acting on it. Well, as climate change accelerates, you see huge refugee flows, right? So many of the, re the refugees that we're seeing come now to the US from Central America are also climate migrants, and there's going to be more and more of that. So I really feel like for all people of good faith, for people of every faith, um, we have got to get ahead of this, because the efforts to stoke hatred against the vulnerable, the different, et cetera, are going to get worse and worse from the right, and um, and I do believe that there, there are, the vast majority of people are decent and would not support this if they understood what was going on, but I think that we all have a role to play in, in writing our world at this moment.